All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here for our nanotechnology engineering virtual Ask Me Anything. Uh, my name is Abby. My pronouns are she, they, and I am an undergraduate recruitment specialist in the Faculty of Engineering. Very excited to have you here uh, to share a little bit more about what our nanotechnology engineering program is all about. Um, yeah, and let's, let's get right into it. So the University of Waterloo would like to acknowledge that much of our work takes place in the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus in Waterloo is situated on the Haldeman Tract, and that's the land that was granted to the Six Nations, including six miles on either side of the Grand River. Our active work towards reconciliation takes place across our campuses through research, learning, teaching, and community building, and all of that is centralized within our Office of Indigenous Relations. We encourage you to visit nativeland.ca to learn more about the land that you occupy, wherever you might be joining us from today. A few important reminders before we get started. Uh, closed captioning is available by clicking the CC button on the bottom of your screen, and you can submit any questions that you might have for our panelists throughout the presentation using the Q&A button that you should also be able to see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we're going to try to respond to as many as we can during the moderated Q&A portion of the event, which will happen after the presentation, uh, but we might also respond to some uh, via typed response as well. If you have any outstanding questions that we're not able to get to, or just any specific or additional questions after the webinar, you can always email those to us at nginfo at uwaterloo.ca, and we'll be happy to answer them. So I mentioned we'll be having lots of panelists on the call with us today and available to do a Q&A after the presentation. So we have Ting, who is our Director of Nanotechnology Engineering, who'll do the bulk of the presentation, sharing with you all uh, what nanotechnology engineering is all about. And then we have um, a number of great panelists with us. So there's Jun Xu, who is a nanotechnology engineering alumnus from 2019. Uh, Sarah, who's in her fourth year of nanotechnology engineering. Asher, who is in his second year of nanotech. And Michael, who is in his third year of nanotech. So they're all uh, going to be joining us for that Q&A portion. So if you think of any questions throughout the presentation that you might want to ask them, feel free to put them in the Q&A. All right, so I'm going to be handing it over to Ting now to kind of give an overview of what our program is all about. Okay, thank you, Abby. I, uh, I guess good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Um, so I'm Ting and I'm the director of the Nanotechnology Engineering Program. So I'm going to uh, try to show you some of the um, examples of what, what's Nanotechnology Engineering uh, and some of the curriculums uh, in our coursework. Next slide, please. So let's take a look what are things that are small in terms of nanometer scale. So um, on the right hand side, you can see a human hair um, and the dimension or uh, the diameter of the human hair is roughly about uh, 100,000 uh, nanometers. And then you have human cells, the human cells is about 10,000 nanometer. And then you can go to the smaller bacteria is about a thousand nanometer viruses. So they're much smaller, they're in turn the orders of hundreds of nanometer. And then now we're talking something that human being made, engineering, uh, so such as a transistor, okay? So these are the brain of the integrated circuits and they're in the order of 10 nanometer. And when you want to go even smaller scale, then we have water molecule, they are less than one nanometer in dimensions. So as you can see, um, actually the one of the most amazing thing that human being can uh, produce or manufacture in a transistor actually is smaller than most of the biological substance out there, such as virus, bacteria, or even human cells. Next, please. So what's nanotechnology engineering? So it is small scale, big impact, and is at the science and engineering and technology conduct in the nanoscale. And this program or uh, is recognized by the Professional uh, Engineers Ontario and this program is for students with board interest in electrical and chemical engineering, and then chemistry, biology, and physics. What do nanotechnology engineers do? Um, they do, we use the uh, principles from chemistry, electronic, biology, physics, to design materials and devices that have the interesting properties. So we also design systems with dimension on the nanometer scale, and which means it measures in the billions of a meter and to direct control of matter on the atomic scale. So let's look at some of the examples um, of the nanotechnology engineering products. Uh, once 
of the most important one recently is uh, COVID-19 vaccines. Um, so if you have a COVID-19 vaccine, such as from the Pfizer or Moderna, and they are actually make up of uh, nanoparticles. So you have the mRNA molecules, and then they are going to encapsulate it inside a uh, lipid nanoparticle as shows in the uh, diagram over here. And then uh, because if you just in, inject uh, mRNA molecules in the body, it will decompose readily and cannot uh, simulate the immune response. So you will um, need to generate a nanoparticle and then inject in the bodies and then into the cells and then simulate um, the, uh, the immune response. Okay, that this slide is really good. So the other example is, is integ integrated circuits, or most people call it chips. Okay, so this is some of, of the nano nanotechnologies that cannot live without. And uh, each chip may have billions of transistors on it, and then each transistor can be smaller than twenty nanometer. So it's everywhere. It's in your cell phones. Um, it's in your computer, in the LED light controller, in the phone, in a car. It's everywhere surrounding us. So if you have one day that doesn't have any silicon chips or all the integrated circuits does not work, um, then we would we'll, we'll not have any cars. We will not have any phones. You cannot have do Instagram, no more TikToks. And so basically we get back to the stone age. And technology such as the AI or content computing, they all still depends on the chips. So it's quite an important technology that is developed by um, the nanotechnology engineering. Okay. So uh, this picture shows actually a, what you call a silicon wafer. And as you can see, it looks shiny. Okay, so it really looks pretty. And you look closer to it, and actually there are a lot of different rectangular shaped structures on it. Each of those rectangular shaped structure is corresponding one chips. So these are the integrated circuits that's eventually going to be putting onto our cell phone, cars, and other applications. And this nanotechnology is a big and matured um, business. Okay, for example, um, this way picture shows a 300 millimeter wafers. You can may have about 1500 chips on each of this wafer. If each of these chip worth about 200 bucks, then this entire wafer can worth $300,000. So in industrial scales, I mean, one of these wafer can be worth hundreds of thousand dollars, sometimes go even millions of dollars. So this is one of the uh, very valuable technologies out there. Um, companies such as Intel, Micron's, uh, Texas Instruments, Samsung, they make a lot of these chips for different type of applications that drive your phones, drive your cars, and also enable AI technologies or some other future technologies. Next, please. So let's take a look at uh, some of the hands-on learning experience in the dedicated laboratories and clean room at the University of Waterloo. So one of the crown jewels of our uh, of the nanotechnology engineering uh, program at the University of Waterloo is a dedicated clean room for our undergraduate students. So over here, you see some of the pictures showing um, actually a, uh, instructors and students working in the clean room, uh, a lot of shiny instruments. They are all vacuums uh, based, okay? So one some of the equipments we have is a film depositions, uh, such as a plasma enhanced uh, chemical vapor deposition techniques or physical vapor deposition for metal deposition, for metal film films. Um, on the little funny, uh, pictures on the right hand side actually is showing a picture of a um, PECVD chambers and uh, plasma chambers and you can actually see the purple plasma surrounding um, a uh, sample substrate and we also have a uh, edge process such as reactive iron edge and also we have wet chemical edge that can remove uh, materials from the substrate to create patterns or, or chips. Next please. So this picture shows actually um, the clean room uh, that uh, the clean room area that perform photolithographies. Um, there's nothing wrong with the pictures. The the room is all yellow uh, because we work with some light sensitive photoresists. So we try to um, avoid certain wavelengths of light um, that can accidentally develop uh, the photoresists uh, and make our pattern uh, disrupt our pattern. So we have a photoresist spin coder in it 
uh, photo resist baking units, mask and liner, UV exposure to, and other uh, fancy equipment uh, in this portion of the clean room. Next, please. Um, since we make very small objects in the nanotechnology engineering, so we also need some uh, uh, instrumentations of microscope that can look at uh, features that is much smaller than optical microscope can see. So one of these techniques is advanced uh, image systems such as the scanning electron microscopes, or some people call it the SEM. And uh, as I mentioned, it can see things that is actually smaller than a normal optical microscope can see. So the bottom left corner shows um, a picture of the eye of a fly. And then the picture next to it shows um, uh, super nano wires um, the student made in their lab. Next, please. Um, as I mentioned before, nanotechnology engineering consists an important component is in, uh, nano electronics. So we also have nano electronic labs, and this consists of many probe stations for the student to characterize the device that they develop or fabricated. Um, these are some of the instruments, uh, such as the micropropane stations, semiconductor parameter analyzers, um, quartz crystal microbalance, and other optical spectro spectrometers and other apparatus. Next, please. Uh, we also have laboratories uh, for material synthesis. Okay, so the left hand side shows some of the uh, laboratories for that purposes. So we have we do polymers, carbon nanotubes, graphene, and also batteries. The batteries that we're talking about is not like the Energizer Bunny, the traditional type. We're thinking about something that is new generation for the new futures. There are a lot of research going on to develop lightweight batteries, high energy densities. Okay, so there are many different applications in uh, of new materials uh, or new nanomaterials. And then we also have a uh, nano bio system laboratory. As I mentioned before, um, nano bio is actually one of the big area for nanotechnologies. Um, so we have a uh, laboratory for biochemistry, uh, biosensor, target drug delivery, design of DNA and peptides, and also microfluidic devices. Um, so we will have laboratories that students can take uh, to get some hands-on experience in this area. Next, please. Um, so we also have a fleet of uh, 3D printer. Um, so during the first year, actually first term, uh, we will train the students how to use it. And after that, the student can come in and prototype um, things that they want to do. Um, so uh, we love to have a student um, create many exciting structures or devices to, um, to their liking. So after graduation, um, where are you going to go? So this is always a big question. Over here, um, show the distributions um, of the students, uh, where did they go after they graduated. About 53% go to straight to industry, and then about 39% to academia, which means they are going for advanced degrees, such as obtaining a master's degree, PhD degree, um, some of them actually went to medical school or get an MBA. So those are belongs to this 39% um, of students. And then 8% of them uh, will have startup. Startup basically means the student has some great idea, um, particularly in the fourth year, uh, maybe a new device, new idea, new materials. And they go out and form their own companies and they continue um, this process after they graduate and uh, perform business out of it. And on the left hand side shows um, some em the employers okay, of the uh, students, um, such as Intel, Apple, AMD, NVIDIA, they are the AI companies now, uh, Google, LAMS Research, so far and so on, including semiconductors, healthcare, and different uh, sectors. And on the right hand side shows some of the graduate schools um, that our alumni um, went to, uh, such as Harvard, Stanford, MIT, Caltech, Cambridge, Berkeley, uh, Georgia Tech, so forth and so on. So they go to all different places all over the world and doing quite successfully after they graduate. Next, please. So in terms of the industrial sectors, where they, they go after they graduated, um, these are the distributions. So the biggest portion of them come goes to semiconductor and electronic industries. And then a lot of them also go to software and IT uh, business. And then um, another big component is healthcare and pharmaceuticals. 
Um, so soft, software uh, is also a big business right now. I mean, this um, and in our program, we do um, prepare our students in terms of programming and data analysis. So it's to prepare themselves, they can go to multiple sectors such as software. And on the left hand side, show some of the employers that uh, hires them. Okay, next please. Um, this is the curriculum overview for the first year. Um, one A means the first term you are on campus, and then one B means the second term. So during the first term, um, you will learn something on nanotechnology engineering practices, introduction introduction to nanotechnology engineering. Uh, this course actually now also have um hands on X lab that you will go with it. Introduction to programming for engineers. Programming means computer programming. Um, linear algebra for nanotechnology engineers. Engineers. So this is a math class. Societal and environmental impact of nanotechnology. So this is important because we are developing a lot of new materials. So we need to know, understand what the impacts to the society and also to the environment. Uh, chemical principles, which is NU one. 21, that is a uh, first year chemistry course. And then of course, uh, we're engineers, so we need to take calculus one for engineering. Um, during the second term, you will take more courses, okay? So nanotechnology engineering practices, uh, second calculus class, um, introduction to computational methods. So this is an, the second level of uh, uh, programming. And then linear circuits. So we will teach you how to the basics of uh, this circuit design and how the circuits function. Um, and then you will also take some physics class for nanotechnology engineering, and then introduction to material science and engineering, and also introduction to nanomaterial uh, health risk. Next, please. And then in the final couple of years, um, you can start to concentrate into different areas such as micro and nano. Uh, instrumentations, nano electronics, nano biosystem, or uh, nano engineering materials. Um, the table shows on the left there are some of the elective courses that the third year and the fourth year student can take. So it includes um, software and nano materials, photonic materials and devices. Photonic means the material devices are um, influenced by light. And then you look at, and then you take another class in surface and interfaces. Uh, nanoprobing and lithographies, introduction to nano biosystems. So those are the elective during the third year. And then in the fourth year, you can take uh, simulation methods. So this uh, programming, okay, so you can simulate maybe certain molecules, uh, certain experiments, okay. And then we have uh, micro and nano instrumentations, nano electronics, nano medicine, and nano uh, biotechnologies, nano structural materials. Okay, so the new batteries or new type of materials uh, will be introduced in this class. Um, we And then in the final term, 4B, then we also had electives for special topics in nanoscale simulations and then uh, uh, research projects, microfluidics and nanobiotechnology system, biomaterial, biomedical designs, and also for nanomaterials for electrochemical engineering system. So basically it means uh, energy storage uh, devices. And in addition to um, the core programs, the students can also take options uh, in engineering. For example, they can take options, which means other courses uh, in areas such as artificial intelligence, biomechanics, computer engineering, computing, entrepreneurships, if you want to found your own company, uh, environmental engineering, international study in engineering, life science, management science, mechatronics, physical science, software engineering, and statistics. So uh, just like any other um, engineering program in Waterloo, this is a co-op program. Uh, the co-op schedule for the nanotechnology engineering program is on the top left. Um, so during the first two terms, you are on campus, and then you take one camp, one term off during spring for the co-op, and then come back on campus into A for class. And then in winter term, you go to the second co-op back in on campus into B. And then after that, you start eight months in and eight months out. So in year three, you have eight months co-op, and then come back for eight months, going back out for eight months co-op, and then back uh, to find to complete the degree in 4A and 4B on campus. Um, so on the left-hand corner, uh, the left-hand side, there's another table showing you 
um, the average rate of pay for Canadian work term. And as you can see, the left side, uh, the left side is the beginning, the term number one, and then uh, finally the last co-op term is term number six. So as you can see, the average uh, pay rate increases, okay, from about eighteen dollars to about twenty-seven dollars when you're getting more experience. Um, the bottom half shows some of the employer. So in the industry, we have people from work for Tesla, Apple, Mercedes Benz. Um, General Dynamics, and so on, so on. There are many other companies. Um, some folks want to go to grad school, so they will go to some other university. Uh, maybe perform research, such as Harvard, MIT, Caltech, UT, uh, so as some other school in the U.S. Um, and some folks work for government agencies, such as um JPL and then uh, NLC. Um, so there are many options out there, and go to our student do co-ops all around the world. Okay, so that's all I have. So, any questions? Thank you so much, Tang. Uh, before we get into our q and I do just want to touch on a few other things, ways to connect with us beyond this webinar. Uh, so first and foremost, chats with our engineering student ambassadors. You can chat anytime uh, with current students in the Faculty of Engineering. Uh, just following that link there is uh, how you can chat with them, and they're happy to share some of their experiences in their programs with you. Any admissions related uh, questions can be emailed to edgeinfo at uwaterloo.ca. That goes directly to our admissions team. Uh, and of course, one of the best ways to determine if Waterloo is right for you is to come on campus. Uh, so we have lots of tours that run uh, every day of the week, and we also have lots of events. Our next event will be our March open house, uh, which ha is happening March 23rd. So if you're able to come to campus, uh, that's a great way to come meet uh, more of our faculty, more, more of our current students and learn some more about uh, what we're all about. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and I'll invite uh, the panelists to turn their cameras on. Uh, if you do have any questions for any of our panelists, uh, whether it be Ting, a faculty member, uh, an alumni, or any of our current students, feel free to pop them in the Q&A now. Um, and yeah, so I'll let everyone uh, introduce themselves, give a kind of an overview of who you are, um, and then maybe I'll also ask that you just kind of describe uh, what drew you to nanotech engineering. Why did you uh, choose to apply to it um, initially? And maybe we'll start with Asher and kind of work our way from uh, the person who's closest to uh, that initial draw and then to our alumni last. Hey folks, so my name is Asher, as you touched on there, Abby. I'm in my very, very early stages of my degree here. So I, I do remember very much what it was like to be in your shoes, contemplating what type of engineering should I go to or what should I do for my undergrad? The first thing that drew me towards nanotech, honestly speaking, was the name. Like, ooh, nanotech, what is this? I wanna learn more all about it. It sounded really, really cool to me as I'm sure it does for you. And my next step was looking at some of the courses I actually, I did go on a shadow day. I did do the end chats that we talked about earlier in the presentation. And that's what sold it for me. Talking to upper year students and them telling me all about their experiences and how much they really liked it, how passionate they were about it. That's what sold me on it. We also have an engineering quiz. You can find it somewhere on our website. I'll, I'll paste the link if I can in the chat later on. But the, I was able to rank my, based on my interest in some of the fields I'd be interested in studying for an undergrad, it gave me Nanotech is my first choice, chemical is my second, and I think it was environmental is my third. I can't remember anymore, but nano and chemical are very closely tied together. There's a lot of chemistry that we do in nano, and ultimately I decided to go with nano because I just looked at the courses and it seemed like it was the perfect fit for me. And in the program now, I can say that I think it is. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Michael, do you want to share next? Yeah, for sure. Uh, hi, I'm Michael. Uh, I just finished 3B of in nanotech. So uh, I'm currently working at Tesla as a manufacturing engineer. So I live in California right now, which is cool. Um, so what drew me into nanotech was I really love chemistry. I will say that was like the biggest thing for me. Um, when I was looking into the programs that had the most chemistry, it was just nanotech was that, but not only that, um, it just gives us a really broad range of skills in terms of not only chemistry, but you have the option to look into biology, you have the option to do uh, electronics and just basic materials as well. So I really liked the, the broad aspect of it because I like exploring a lot of things. So that's what drew me to this program. So, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. And Sarah. 
Hello, my name is Sarah. I'm in currently in my 4B nanotechnology engineering, so I'm almost done. I'm going to be graduating this April. Um, but what initially drew me to this program was just the potential the program has in terms of biology, electrical, all of those different things that I can do with the with this program specifically. Of course, I I used to like more of the biology, medical devices aspects of it, but I'm currently more into the electrical aspects of it, and that can change, and that program helped me open up like that. But yeah, and another thing that drew me in is the fact that I really loved physics and quantum mechanics. And I noticed that these four, they offer a lot of these type of courses here. And that's so I just decided to choose it. Amazing. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, Chin Shu, our alumnus. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. So my name is uh, Chin Shu. I graduated from the nanotech en nanotechnology engineering program in 2019, uh, pre-pandemic. So I've been out of school for quite a while uh, at this point, about five years. What initially drew me to the program? Oh, actually, let's talk about uh, what I'm currently doing right now. So I'm currently uh, actually still in Kitchener-Waterloo. I'm working for a startup based out of Velocity called uh, IC Spy, spell, uh, spelled out I-C-S-P-I, uh, working as an application engineer, um, essentially in like like benchtop AFMs, right? Atomic force microscopes. So what originally drew me to the technology to the nanotechnology engineering program was I was very interested in academia. Uh, I specifically was interested in becoming a professor. My goals changed throughout undergrad, but at the time that was really what I was very interested in. Also, I was particularly inspired by like, you know, a lot of sci-fi actually, like reading about uh, the works of Michael Crichton, as well as like a very famous series of lectures uh, by Richard Feynman talking about how there's plenty of room at the bottom and the potential for nanotechnology and how it can shape our future. Right. Well, thank you so much. All right. Getting to some of the questions that are going in the Q&A. I saw, Ting, that you uh, tipped to respond to this, but it's a very popular question. So if I can get uh, you to comment on, on it as well. Um, how would you compare nanotech engineering to electrical or computer engineering? Oh, yeah. So nanotech, as um, Sarah, Michael, and uh, Ash already mentioned, um, we definitely have more chemistry um, component to it. Um, and also the biologies. So uh, for me, I think it's advantageous because it actually prepare for future technologies. Um, one of the uh, interesting one is um, Elon Musk has been, uh, uh, I guess uh, you look at the news, he was uh, looking for volunteer to have uh, uh, the neural implant to their, uh, to their technologies in their head. So it's actually a lot of buzz about it. So in that particular component, you need a uh, biological and also uh, electrical components knowledge uh, in order to achieve this. So I think nanotechnology is really well positioned as to this. Um, I, I think there will be a lot of applications coming down in the next maybe decades. Um, it's interface between human being and uh, electronic devices. Um, I, I always uh, talk with uh, a lot of my uh, students uh, once in a while. Um, think about it. Do you regret your phone being fast enough when you do the texting? Um, because you know, how fast you text depends on how fast you can uh, phone moves. But in the future, I can envision if you put a chips or any sort of uh, devices um, to your neural web network, you think, and then it, the text shows up on your screen. Um, so especially playing video games, you can do much, much faster with that too. So I can see a lot of application coming down the pipe, and there's a lot of people um, in the bus uh, discussing how this kind of like seems like far out technology, but I think it's also possible in the near future. And I think that technology will be, will be a good place to start. Yeah, that's very cool. It's good. Definitely when I hear things about nanotechnology, I always think of those futuristic things that Shinshu was talking about. Um, and when I'm watching those movies, I always think of oh, what our students are up to. Um, so a related question, maybe I'll pose this one to Sarah, because I know you mentioned you're, you were interested in quantum physics. Uh, this person's wondering, is there a lot of quantum physics in nanotech engineering? So it really does depend on the courses. A lot of like the biology related courses don't really have as much, but stuff, for example, like semiconductors or even statistical thermodynamics would have a lot of like quantum physics just because when you're dealing with nanotechnology at a scale so small you're gonna be interacting with a lot of stuff that are se that are separate from like the classical mechanics the stuff that we know for now even like if you think about it, even just electrons traveling around the like a proton that's 
that's quantum physics. So it's how do you how do you deal with the interaction of molecules and atom and all of that together? And we cover that in simulations method, for example. I also mentioned semiconductor physics, all of that. So I would say yes or no. It really is dependent on the courses that you're taking, but it does come up quite often. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And kind of a related question, uh, speaking of courses, um, I know, Ting, you talked about, you know, there's that option in their upper years to choose concentrations and things like that. Uh, so let's say if a student isn't as interested in quantum physics, is there that opportunity to explore other sides of nanotechnology? Oh, sorry, they get muted. <laughs> yeah, there's the... Um... Well, the con quantum is actually a class that is a core courses you need to take. Uh, but after the word, you can actually expand it into these multiple areas. So one of the areas, for example, simulations or computer like simulation method basically means computations. So in that case, um, you probably need to know some quantum mechanics and then start to do modeling on it. Uh, so, so some area you have you, you may not need to do a lot of hands-on experiments, but more focus on programming and modeling. So, um, so yeah, just for folks that don't like to go to uh, um, the lab and uh, like to be more interactive with the computer, so there's many other opportunities to do that too. Um, so th that's actually, um, if I may, to kind of uh, open up a little bit more. Um, so just for my last few just throughout the decades, um, some of our graduates um, actually go into the financial sector and even during the co-op terms. So it's kind of very interesting because now we have the big data analysis and a lot of mathematical components in it. And our engineering programs has a lot of calculus uh, classes and we prepare the students to do a lot of math modeling. But in this case, it's modeling how the stock markets perform, how the data risk analysis perform. So um, yeah, so I mean, I, I talked with several students um, actually um, went into that, that directions. So by the time they done, they actually work what are called the FinTech, financial technologies, which is actually a pretty big business. Um, and you think about it, this, they're quite important. Uh, for example, if you are a um, mutual fund managers. So you basically, your job is buy and sell stocks. Every time you buy and sell stocks, it can be in the order of hundreds of millions of dollars easily. So um, so how do you make the decision to buy and sell stocks? So you need to know the technologies, like if you want to buy which technology company and when to sell, it depends on the products. So um, by understanding the nanotech or high tech field um, can prepare our students to go into financials um, area because they have well background to it. And at the same time, they understand the financial aspect on it using the mathematical knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. And a couple of related questions as well. So um, one part of this question, what makes nanotechnology different than biomedical engineering? And then second part of that, um, this student's wondering, they didn't take any biology classes, which by the way, for prospective students, biology isn't uh, one of our required courses for any of our engineering programs, but they're wondering if nanotech would be harder for them because they didn't take any biology classes, um, or if they wanted to focus in that area of electronics, programming, or chemistry sides, uh, would there be opportunities to do that instead? So Ting, if you wanna maybe comment on it's a very multi-part question, but I'll let you comment first and then maybe we'll get some student alumni perspectives. Yep. Um, so um, biology, don't worry about it. We actually teach you, we have biology class and then you can actually take it and from the most fundamental, fundamental levels up. And um, this is the same for programming. While we're ask, answering, ask, answering that question, a lot of students concerning, I haven't done programming in high school, will I have issues? No. Because actually the first term um, at Waterloo, we actually teach you the most basic of programming and then we build the knowledge on. So in the biology, we also do the same thing. Don't worry about it. When you get on campus, we will teach you all those fundamental components. And then one other part to that question, what are your thoughts on what makes nanotechnology different from biomedical engineering? Oh, okay. So um, yeah, the nanotechnology, for example, um, as I mentioned before, nanoparticle vaccines. So they are from chemistry point of view. So they actually 
synthesizing chemistry for the medical applications. So uh, if I understand correctly, biomedical engineering is for device level development. So it's a very two different approach. Um, uh, but again, having said that, um, our students, especially in the four feet design projects, some of them actually capable to do uh, to develop uh, prototypes uh, in biosensors and also biomedical devices. So I would say um, the nanotechnology students can also do portion of nano uh, uh, biomedical uh, devices area. Uh, but I'm not sure biomedical engineering students can do the chemical component synthesis like what we do which is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And I, I do know there's, I don't know the exact name of the option, but there's an option in something like biomedical devices or biomedical engineering or biomedical sciences along those lines. So if you're interested in really going down that bio route uh, within nanotechnology engineering, you could add that option to your degree and take a handful of courses uh, kind of specialized in that area. But I want to get some student alumni uh, perspective. So, Michael, I know you have done a couple um, bio-focused co-ops. What are your thoughts on kind of specializing within nanotechnology engineering and, and kind of everything that's been discussed thus far? Yeah, for sure. So for me, I am a kid that didn't take any bio in high school. <laughs> I literally did a it was a grade 10 and then that was it because I didn't like it but uh took bio to be it was fine it's in it's an intro course so um they take things slow and if you really do have a lot of questions like you can just ask the professor nobody wants to see you fail here so um it was a pretty good course I would say um so that was pretty cool um and then for my basically every single one of my co-ops or three out of my six co-ops um, it been in the biomedical, uh, biomechanical engineering space, which has been really cool. So it's been really cool to see how applicable what we do in class is, um, cause it's like, oh, I need a lot of chemistry to understand what's going uh, on in like the actual device itself. I need to understand like the continuum mechanics and the fluids that go into certain systems while designing these devices. Um, and then also just electronics that we get as well. Um, so it's, based off the broadness of what we do in the program it's really um, helped me out um, through these co-ops and not only that even at tesla now um, there's a lot of stuff that's coming up from my previous classes that are really helping me now um wait I'm trying to say with stuff without breaking my nda <laughs> um <laughs> so i work on a system called the drive unit so that basically means the stuff that makes uh, the car drive, so motors. So a bunch of callbacks from electromagnetism that are required because I'm dealing with permanent magnet motors and induction motors and whatnot. So that's been a real big help. So it helps on all facets uh, of industries, I would say. So it's been fun. Thank you. That's very cool. And I think definitely shows um, that exploration within nanotechnology during your undergrad with those co-ops exploring the different um, realms of, of nanotech. Uh, Chin Shu, what are your thoughts on exploring all these different parts of nanotech? For sure. Um, I can't speak much on the bio front. I also did not take biology during high school. Um, I was never big into bio. I've never done any co-ops related to bio, but I will say from my perspective as an alumni, your experience in the nanotechnology engineering program gives you a lot of uh, like it can give you a lot of exposure and a lot of really good experience that's relevant to working in the semiconductor industry, particularly. So there's a lot of really applicable stuff there. Uh, so like my past, so some of my past jobs, right? I was working for a display startup uh, and a lot of my work involved work with the semiconductor industry, with the flat panel display industry. Uh, my current job still involves a lot of nanotechnology engineering work. So a lot of my current job involves understanding MEMS. So MEMS is an acronym that stands for micro electromechanical systems. So this is like very tiny moving parts that are like fabricated uh, in like a nanofab or microfab facility, essentially. So I think uh, nanotechnology gives you a really good base for getting into semiconductors, for designing chips, uh, like what was talked about in the presentation, 
And yeah, like kind of a nano, uh, a good breakdown I've heard before is that nano kind of splits into two sections where you have like a section of nano that focuses a lot on biological applications, like wet nano in a sense. And you also have another part that focuses on dry applications. So that would be for the terms of like, in terms of like material science, in terms of chips, in terms of semiconductors and that aspect. So those are kind of the two large branches you can kind of think of nano in terms of. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful. Thank you. And I do just see someone, they say they're still struggling to understand that relationship between nanotechnology and biology. Did anyone want to try to take a, um, a whack at explaining that again and kind of maybe how you understand that connection? Sure. Uh, yes, I remember these presentations from Ting, <laughs> from OUF. <laughs> so, um, a lot of it comes down to um, when you think of like vaccines, like the COVID vaccine was actually made using nanotechnology engineering. And we learned how to actually properly do that uh, in class. And you can do um, targeted drug delivery when you try and like engineer different drugs to specialize in certain things, um, you're going to need to go really small. And in order to do that, you need to understand biology uh, in that application of the nanotechnology space. So you can actually have better medicine per se. That's why we actually have like courses in our upper years where you can take like uh, nano school, uh, nano medicine and whatnot. So you can actually make those better uh, targeted drugs and whatnot. So, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, actually a lot of interesting area um, such as tissue engineering. Um, so basically how to control cells behavior um because well i mean without going too boring into it um you can actually control cells by many different type of phenomena uh from drugs even from surface how the surface structure looks like uh how the pattern on the surface so basically a biological and materials interactions um there are many different ways that can control it um the other way is nanoparticle to cells interactions there's a lot of research work going on uh, as michael's mentioned um, drug delivery is a big thing right now. Um, how how do you guide the nanoparticles or drugs going into cancer cells? So that's actually a lot of research going on. Um, the, and it's still going. And and it, it, I think eventually people will find some way. Um, hopefully one of these days you take a pills and cure all cancers. Um, I can see that happen with a lot of progress recently uh, using nanoparticle technologies. That's very exciting. Thank you. And a kind of a phrase that we use a lot when we talk about nanotechnology engineering is tiny but mighty. Um, so I definitely think in that biological realm is something where I really see it is um, any like those nanoparticles, um, you know, they can really accomplish amazing things. Um, yeah, so hopefully that clarifies some things. We're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the ever so popular co-op questions. Uh, so this question is asking how the co-op selection works exactly. So I'm going to try to give a rundown and then maybe we can get uh, some, some perspectives on co-op because it is such a big part of what we do at Waterloo. So uh, we kind of showed that breakdown of the co-op sequences. So in uh, nanotechnology, you're in stream eight with a little bit of a twist. Uh, so stream eight basically means that you do eight months of school and then you'll have your first co-op work term. So you do your first eight months of school. Don't worry about it. In your uh, second term, the, the four months in your winter term before your work, first work term, you're going to be applying to jobs. So we have a job posting platform. It's called Waterloo Works. It's sort of like Indeed or any sort of job posting platform that you might be familiar with, right? now um, and you go online you can scroll through jobs and you have access to all the same jobs that anyone at the University of Waterloo has access to uh, any co-op student at the University of Waterloo has access to so um, you're not restricted based on your year or your program so that's kind of why uh, for example Michael might be doing biomedical engineering uh, centric uh, co-ops um, we don't really have like these are only for the biomedical engineering student type things it's open to everybody um, so you apply by submitting your resume uh, from there, employers choose who they want to interview you go through the interview process um, and then you go through a ranking and matching process 
this is where it gets a little bit uh, complicated and not necessarily something you need to worry about right now. Uh, but in that process, uh, basically, if you're if an employer ranks you number one and you rank them number one, that means that you both want to they want to employ you and you want to work for them. And that's a match. So uh, that basically means that you uh, got the job. Um, so it is a competitive process. You apply for jobs just like you do in the real world. Uh, so I usually like to say a hidden benefit of co-op is that you get that job application um, experience. Um, and then you also have lots of other options beyond Waterloo Works to arrange your own job and et cetera, et cetera. I could go on forever. Uh, how about we start with Chin Shu, who has the most experience. Um, what was your co-op journey like? Where did you work and what was that application process like? Yeah, so um, I worked in all manners of different places. So some people will, you know, work the same type of co-op job for all of their co-ops. Other people do not. I did not do that. So my first co-op was with a Velocity startup, and I was basically doing product design on like an automotive safety tool. So that involved a lot of prototyping using computer-aided design, as well as 3D printing. My second job, I worked for the federal government doing research in wireless telecommunications. My third co-op job, I worked for another Waterloo startup, but a larger one this time, uh, doing work in applications of hyperspectral imaging for contaminant detection in industrial food lines. My fourth co-op job, I did it in uh, coding science with like BASF, which is like a large multinational uh, chemicals corporation. So I've essentially been all over the place. And then after that, my two jobs, uh, my, my two full-time jobs afterwards was I went to uh, go work in St. John's, Newfoundland for three years for a display startup there, working as a process design specialist um, in essentially like display technology. And then I'm now recently working for IC Spy in MEMS and AFM technology. So uh, there really is a whole wide range of jobs that you can access through that. Like I know plenty of people as well, including friends that basically stuck with software jobs for their entirety of all of their co-op terms, even though they were in nano. And I know people that have worked for patent offices. I know people that have done like international co-ops in Australia, in Singapore, doing various types of research and whatnot. In terms of the process, it was pretty much as Abby described. You So we had job mine back then, which was the system before Waterloo Works. Uh, that change kind of happened during the course of my undergrad. And essentially, you apply to various jobs uh, as part of various cycles. There's like first round, second round, and continuous round. And then you receive information regarding interviews. And then from that, there's essentially a matching process, as Abby kind of described. I don't want to talk too much about because I don't know what, uh, what the current process is like hugely right now. But that's essentially kind of what my co-op experience was like. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, definitely good to know that you have that option to like every every co-op can be with a different company. Um, you can try out those different things. And maybe that's um, how I recommend folks uh, try co-op just because it's such a great way to explore different careers, uh, build your network with lots of different companies. And, you know, after graduation, if you job hop every four months, that's not a great reputation. But in co-op, you're kind of expected to do that. Uh, so it's really a unique experience. Uh, Sarah, what sort of co-ops have you done and, and what's the process been like for you? So my co-ops have also been all over the place. I went from like optical related. So for example, my first co-op term was actually creating fiber optic cables for astronomy related fields. My second co-op was more of like a medical device quality assurance type of co-op. So that like that one, that's not my only like medical device type, type of co-op. My next two co-op terms which are both the eight month co-op terms the first one being a I was an optical algorithms and analytics engineer so there was a lot of programming but it was for a telecommunication company and it also was related to of course optics and my final co-op I actually worked with at Intel and I was designing chips so what what my responsibility was was to place the transistors and do all the routings and interconnect between the transistors to make a functioning chip so of course, it's all over the place. I'm, I'm more at this current moment. I'm more focusing on the electronics aspect of it because that's and that's what I realized that I like the most. So each co-op helped me figure out what aspects I like and what aspects I don't like, and that's what I'm gonna do for my final, like after I graduate. Um, the co-op co application. I got all my co-ops from Waterloo Works, and of course, there's also. So as they described before, there's a first round, second round, and then there's a continuous round. 
usually if like if you don't get the first and second round you can go into continue it but with every co-op term it gets easier and easier to find the jobs and with my last two co-op terms i was able to find it within the first job so that's been my experiences and yeah there's a lot of help with resume critiques and interviews and it's just been an overall smooth experience that's wonderful thank you and that's also uh, another good thing to highlight i called uh, nanotech stream eight with a twist uh because it's uh stream eight but you have those uh eight month co-ops as well which some programs don't have a lot of programs don't have so um that's kind of a unique experience for nanotech students where you get those eight month co-ops so that you can stay with the company a little bit longer um maybe you take on larger projects projects that uh you might not be able to accomplish in four months um so that's something that's good to highlight as well Michael, we touched a little bit on your co-op experience, but did you want to expand on anything, talk about the process as well? Yeah, sure. I'll keep it shorter. <laughs> so uh, Sarah and I actually worked at the same same place for, for co-op. My first co-op, uh, we both worked uh, at a brain and spine surgery company. I did regulations there, um, made sure the device got into the European Union and the U.S. military. Uh, second co-op, I was a product design engineer at a company that made infrared heaters. Um, so I helped them just design their new heater and some new test fixtures for them. Uh, my third and fourth co-op, uh, I worked as an opto mechanical engineer at a medical company uh, that made a, a microangioscope that can go through your veins and arteries. Oh, wait, no, a small camera that could go through your veins and arteries to see if you have blood clots or whatnot. And then another device, uh, a new way to remove blood clots in the brains of stroke victims. And then, yeah, now I'm at Tesla uh, as a manufacturing engineer. So overall, the process was pretty smooth. Uh, for the first four co-ops, I did it through Waterloo Works, um, and I had no problems. Uh, it was pretty fun. I would say I'm one to actually enjoy the co-op search, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then through, I got Tesla through uh, external means. So I just applied on LinkedIn and their and their uh, their own website, and I applied through there. So you can actually arrange your own job. Uh, if you don't, uh, or if you have any connections within your network in terms of like, oh, if you have an uncle that works at a company that can get you a job, that's another way to to get a job as well. So that's kind of what I did, but I just applied externally and then I filled out, arranged my own job form and then it fulfilled the requirements. So uh, everything is a-okay. So yeah, co-op is definitely one of the, the best parts about uh, Waterloo, I'd say. So yeah. That's perfect. Yes. And if your dream job isn't on Waterloo Works, you can definitely uh, go that route of arranging your own job. And lots of students will just cold call companies that they want to work for and say, hey, I'm looking for, for a co-op. And, you know, they take that initiative. And as long as it's a real job and, it, and meets some of uh, the co-op requirements, uh, that's perfect, perfectly acceptable as well. Uh, Asher, I believe you're on your first co-op work term now. So if you want to share a little bit about your experience. Sure. So yeah, I've only had the one co-op experience so far, so not that much in terms of overall breadth of experience. I did electrical work working for a school board, actually. So I got to go to various schools that was under that school board jurisdiction, taking a look at their fire alarm and PA systems more specifically, got to do some AutoCAD modeling for that as well, which is very, very nice. So both in the office and in the field, a little bit of a, a hybrid type job in that regard. In terms of the application, I found it very, very smooth sailing as my other panelists, co-panelists, I've mentioned Waterloo Works, very easy to use, simple as upload your resume, upload your cover letter if the company requires it, or you choose to submit one anyway, and then there you go. It takes no time at all to apply, very, very smooth, and as Michael touched on just a second ago, feel free to reach out externally as well, that's a great, great tool for sure. LinkedIn, uh, Indeed, countless job boards externally that you can use, but Waterloo Works, definitely, I, I would start there for sure. It's very, very easy to get started, especially for your first co-op term. Thank you so much. And definitely, I think uh, that first co-op term is what most people are stressed about. So um, I think as uh, Sarah noted, there's lots of supports available uh, to help you through that process as well. Um, OK, a couple more questions that we got here. Uh, one folk is wondering, does Nanotech have a higher acceptance rate because it's one of the less popular industries compared to software and mechanical at Waterloo? Um, in general, it's one of our programs that doesn't have as many applicants uh, compared to software and mechanical. Maybe it's one of the lesser known ones. Um, so that would be why maybe it's less competitive uh, just because it doesn't receive as many applicants, but definitely as far as um, admissions requirements, it is still um, you know, 85 and up 
is what we're looking for and then have all of those required courses as well and we do like to see uh well-rounded individuals as well um and then a question about how nanotechnology engineering works together with other engineering branches and what that relationship looks like so i don't know if anyone wants to jump on that question if you have any thoughts about um, collaboration between industries So I think I can go with that because I have been collaborating a lot with ECE, model electrical engineering, with through like my work at Intel and like even some of my current courses. So um, they do work because you do end up learning. I'm going to talk like specifically about electronics, but within first year, you do have an electronics course. And in your third and upper year courses, you do have an option to take like nano electronics, organic electronics. So so like just electronics a more advanced electronics where you talk about transistors which is like mosfets and they do kind of go hand in hand of course we don't go as in depth in it but it does give you a good basis to start off and from that you can also decide maybe for my technical elective i want to take an ece course rather than one of the nano courses which is what i'm doing currently and uh, they do like it does you do have the prerequisites for it it's it's very like easy to get into these courses but yeah overall they do like work together in that case but it's just not as advanced thank you and i'll also note um you might be familiar we have a capstone design project that happens at the end um, of your undergraduate career where uh, you'll work on an open-ended design project in a team. Um, I'm not too sure if it's been a focus in the past, but at least a focus um, that we're moving towards is that interdisciplinary capstone teams. So um, I believe in the past, it was mostly nanotech engineering students would form a capstone team, uh, but we are moving towards having students from multiple disciplines working on a capstone project together, recognizing that uh, in the workforce, uh, many teams are interdisciplinary. Uh, so Chinshu, was your team, your capstone team, all nanotech students? Uh, it was, yeah. Okay, I, that's what I that's what I think it has been in the past, but definitely uh, that collaboration interdisciplinary is something we're moving towards. And Ting, did you have anything to add there? Oh yeah, actually I work, I used to work for uh, semiconductor companies and um, yeah, we definitely work with many from people with different backgrounds, um, not only in engineering, but also in science. So we can have chemists, uh, we can have chemical engineers, and also we have mechanical engineers because um, some a lot of advanced equipments require special design um, in mechanical parts, especially in robotic. Um, a lot of manufacturing these days um, are all by robots um, and basically controlled by AI. So, you know, so a lot of times we have to work with software persons and then also mechatronic person and also mechanical person to design components and make it work seamlessly um so yes i mean that's engineered by only one area which we really narrow and um in a global scale of manufacturing or even in research we require um a team of engineers with different disciplines to work together in order to make something happen Great, thank you so much. All right, we have lots of great questions, but I do recognize we're heading towards the end of our webinar, so we might not be able to get to all of them. Uh, but I just do just want to know as well that we have our Ask a Warrior program. You could chat with our current students anytime, get their perspective on all these things, or also email us at enginefo at you, and we're happy to answer you there as well. Um, maybe as our final question, we'll touch on um, kind of the workload. Uh, and what that looks like, definitely a common question that we get from, from prospective students. So let's get started with Sarah. Um, what does the workload look like throughout the years and uh, what's your thoughts on kind of that work-life balance? Okay, so first year workload is completely different than final year workload. I don't know if you've ever seen a schedule for a first year nanotechnology engineering student or just engineering student in general, but they do technically have more lecture courses, more seminars, more tutorials. So they would have a schedule for like 8.30 to 4.30, but it's more of a, you don't work independently as much, like the prof, the professor, the TAs will help a lot. But throughout the years, 
your labs would increase, the amount of labs you have would increase, but also the independent work would also increase. So they won't give you as many tutorials, for example. And by the final year, there are either project courses and of course the capstone course, and all of those don't have lectures per se. So the workload becomes more independent. You're more focusing in the lab work type of stuff, more of the research aspects of it, rather than the sitting in a lecture hall and listening to a professor. Of course, that's still there, but I'm comparing my current schedule right now where I am almost free, <laughs> like the entire time I might have like maybe three, three hours of classes a day. And that's not for every single day compared to first year when I had like seven hours of class. So it definitely does change. Absolutely. Definitely good to note that change over the years as well. Uh, let's go over to Asher, who's maybe on the other specter of just finishing your first year. Yeah, you say three hours a day. I can't wait for that to happen for me. <laughs> um, yeah, as you touched on, 8.30 to 4.30, Monday to Friday, that's pretty much what it is. 8.30 to 12.30, your morning block, those will be your lectures. So that's when your professor is teaching you new material. In the afternoon, you'll have maybe a lab one day a week, followed by a tutorial, which is kind of like your, your teaching assistant, your TA, we call them. They'll go over some of the content that your professor taught to you earlier in that week. There's some practice problems, review things like that. So the afternoon will generally be more the tutorial style classes and the, the labs, whereas the mornings will be lectures. The professor's teaching you new material, but yes, 8.30 to 4.30, Monday to Friday, that's pretty much what it's gonna look like for you in first year. Yeah, thank you. And maybe, uh, Michael, if you want to touch a bit on um, balancing workload with extracurriculars and, and those sorts of things. Yeah, for sure. So there is definitely the possibility to have a decent work-life balance. So like for me, I do a lot like during during the school term, I play anywhere from two to three intramural sports at a time. Uh, I'm currently the highest ranking member on the solar car team here at the university, which is a design team that builds solar cars from scratch. Um, I also like to have fun with my friends and I'm still in the program, which is nice. <laughs> Just finished the artist term too. So I think I'm gonna graduate, which is good. <laughs> um, and so that's gonna be cool. But um, it's a lot about understanding where your expectations are um, because sure if you actually are aiming towards getting at what you got in high school which is probably like 95 96 um, you might not have that well of a work-life balance um, but if you adjust your um, expectations in a sense where um, if you're not looking to do a, a post-grad a master's phd then your grades don't really matter when transitioning to industry so um, if you're aiming for an 80 instead um, there's a lot more time to do fun things and actually be balanced because the ratio between your grades and study time is quite exponential. Like the difference between a 75 and like a 90 or 95 is like 20 to 30 hours of extra studying. So for me, it's like, I realized I don't want to do that. Um, I prefer to just get a 75 and I'll do those 20 to 30 hours of extra time on my hands to do design team stuff, to have fun with my friends and just actually maintain a proper balance. Um, so yeah, that's how I kind of navigated uh, throughout the program with that philosophy. Thank you. And Chinchu, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, uh, I recall from my undergrad, second and third year were generally the hardest. Because um, I think in second year and third year, you start getting into more complex topics, but your amount of lectures and labs are still generally remaining the same. Whereas once you hit fourth year, uh, as has been touched on, those kind of go down and you have a bit more free time to independently pursue whatever topics you've chosen. Um, I'll also say just to add on to some of this, right? It's you're, you're probably used to in high school, your grades is largely the singular metric that a lot of your success is judged by. This is very much not the case in university. Grades are simply but one metric out of many. Also, from a personal level, I found that in high school, it was very easy to kind of do everything, right? Whereas in university, that's not the case. Um, you have to have a much greater understanding and develop that understanding. And that happens over time, where you develop that understanding of what it is that you specifically want. Some people may choose to only get 50s or 60s because they have other things they care about. They are very focused on a design team, for instance, or they're working on some other project, right? 
the, the key thing that will really help you be successful in university when it comes to managing your time and managing that work-life balance is building a clear idea of what you yourself personally want. And that it's kind of also separate from what your parents want, from what society tells you you want, and even the pressures of the people around you, because they can provide a lot of pressure as well. In terms of you hear about people, you know, doing these really cool things or going off to California and getting these amazing co-op jobs. And it's hard. It's hard not to get pulled in by a lot of that stuff. But it also gives you a really good mirror and a foil to compare and contrast and think about what you specifically want with your life. Thank you so much. That's definitely very uh, helpful. And I think a lot of uh, high school students in that application phase can be can be stuck with those comparisons and, and everything. So definitely something that's good to keep in mind for everyone. Uh, Ting, did you have any final thoughts that you wanted to share before we close? Um, well, <laughs> Nano is great. Um, so <laughs> and well, I have to say that. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm very proud. I've been here for about uh, 15 years and uh, um, this, the accomplishments of a lot of students uh, never stop amaze me. Um, they learn very broad fields and uh, very successful to prepare themselves for very broad area. As you can see from our previous slide, they're very successful in many different sectors, um, not only in traditional engineering and also in like medical fields when some of them went to become lawyers and some of them become very successful business person. Um, I think that's important, okay, because a career is 40 years long. You need to prepare for the world. The world is changing so fast. You want some engineering program can prepare you to adjust and adapt very quickly. And by just looking at um, how that works, and also how successful they are in different fields. Um, I think we really truly prepare our students for the future very well. Wonderful, thank you so much. All right, thank you so much to our panelists as well as our attendees for attending tonight. Hopefully you learned a lot of great information. If we weren't able to get to your question or if anything else comes up, email us at engineinfo at uwaterloo.ca or feel free to connect with our students uh, via Ask a Warrior. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll see you on campus soon. Take care, everyone.